How many of you believe that in these days we're in, we're going to need to trust Him more? More. More. Yeah. More and more. I know it. I know the Lord's been faithful and He's good and the Lord bless your life in lots of ways. And my goodness, it's just so amazing how, how God does in our life. But there just seems sometimes to be seasons where you just need more, more grace, more ability, more, more ability to believe Him and trust Him. This is what James is talking about. This is the book of James. James is saying to us as Christians, I know you've been through stuff. I know you're going through stuff. I know that life's well, been tough for you. But I, I know you're going to have to go through some more. And so that you might successfully navigate the waters of suffering. James says, let me, let me talk to you about a few things. Let me, let me tell you a few things I know about, about the Lord. Let me tell you a few things that the Holy Spirit has ministered to my heart, being the half-brother of Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine growing up being the half-brother of Jesus? <laughs> yeah, your brother is the Messiah. Imagine that. Imagine playing those little silly games we do as kids, you know, kick the can, hide and seek, and all of those things with Jesus. But then as seeing Jesus grow to maturity and become what God had intended for him to be all along and to have a whole new look at familiar things. At the same brother that you grew up with, now you look at him in a whole different light. He is indeed the Messiah of the world. He is indeed the Son of God. And James says, because there are certain things that are true about our relationship with God, we can count it all joy when we suffer as a child of God. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant, and it doesn't mean that we're going to be happy about it. But it does mean that there can be a joy on the inside of us that can sustain us through the, the tragedies and the, and the issues that come with suffering in our life. Is there anyone in the place who's never suffered as a Christian? You, you've never been there. Would you like for us to pray for you that you might have some suffering so that you can know what the rest of us feel like, all right? Yeah, we've all experienced it, right? I'm not talking about suffering because you've made a bad choice. I'm not talking about suffering because you did some uh, uncharacteristically immature things. I'm not talking about suffering because you, your family won't behave. I'm talking about suffering that seems to come upon you for no reason whatsoever. Suffering that comes in your life simply because you belong to Jesus. And... As this old crazy world goes further and further, and I think anybody with the Spirit of God on the inside of them, of them already feels and senses this, that we just seem to be running headlong towards some conclusion with God in this crazy world. And if we're not, we certainly are running toward much more dangerous days, much more upheaval in life, many things that will challenge us in our daily living. Who knows in these days where it's become novel to, uh, uh, to run rampages and take the lives of innocent people, uh, to walk into church buildings like last Sunday out in Texas, bless them. We pray for all of those that are, that are family members and people that are in that community. I mean, sitting here like you are at this moment, and then all of a sudden, bullets begin ringing through the walls, and bodies begin slumping and falling over, and, and before you know it, everybody in the house is gone or either wounded. I mean, these are evil days. These are tough days. And into these days, we bring the sweet truth of Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him 
how I've proved him o'er and o'er, yeah. over and over. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. Oh, for grace to trust him more. And James says, let me tell you what needs to be true about your life in order for that beautiful hymn, that beautiful sentiment to be true for you. I know I'd like to go away from here today saying, Jesus spoke to my heart today about these things that I'm going to be facing in life and has given me an insight into how to count it all joy when these things come into my life. Now, I'm going to just kind of run at them. I've, I've been preaching this first chapter for, heaven knows, six weeks or so. Um, of course, it's not my fault for a few weeks. You know, we've had hurricanes and floods and youth Sundays. and Not, not that they're on... Pa- <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Not that they are on par the youth Sunday with the hurricanes and the floods. I loved every drop of it. Wesley sits right on the front row. He's, he's one, of, one of our greatest members. He listens to everything I say. Lord bless his heart. And writes papers about it. And run, yeah, and does what I say. One of the few. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you now. One of the few. Most of you probably couldn't even tell me what verses I used last week. But regardless of that, I'm going to press on, all right? Press on. I'm going to, like Tanya's poem, on plow on. Plow on, plow on, plow on, plow on. Yeah. That's our favorite poem, plow on. So let's plow on, and let me just, and I promise you, and don't give me that sigh, like, oh, no, here he goes again, preaching the same thing. But I just got to read some verses, because when I get to where we're going, you know, I want you to kind of remember what it's about. Uh, amen. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, not uppity high muck, just same as you are. No pulling rank. To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. These are Jewish Christians because at this time that's all there were, Jewish Christians. The gospel had not gone to the Gentiles yet. The apostle Paul had not started any ministries. There hadn't even been a council to determine that the Gentiles were worthy to hear of the word of, of God. So it's just, to, it is written to them, but it's written to us because we know that we are the heirs of all of this. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. All of these multifaceted, rainbow-like trials that come upon you quickly and suddenly, uh, you are going to fall into them, not if, but when. Knowing, this is how you can count it all joy, joy knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You're going to have to know something if it's going to matter to you. If you're not, you're going to be sad, forlorn, torn up, distorted. You're not going to get the good out of what's going on. You're going to fight it all the way. You may even have to be put back into another situation. And who wants that? If I'm going to be in something and I'm going to have to endure it and I'm going to have to learn and it's going to mature me and it's going to be to my good even though it might not be pleasant. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to run through that over and over and over again. I'd like to get it the first time, right? Look at your neighbor and say, let's get it the first time. All right, let's get it the first time. All right, I don't want to have to circle back through this, so let me get it the first time. All right, yeah. Uh, If any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom about what? Wisdom about the trial. Wisdom about what you're going through. Wisdom about what God's doing in your life. If any of you lack wisdom about that, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it'll be given to him. God's going to give it to you because it's God's nature to give. God said, I'm not going to, you ask me, and and I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to give it to you because it's my nature to give. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So when you ask the Lord, you need to ask believing. You need to ask uh, without doubt. You need to ask confidently, boldly would be a word that you might want to use. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us, and let us come boldly under the throne of grace that we might obtain grace and find mercy to help before it's too late. So God tells us when we come into his presence, don't be sheepish or shy or backward or, or, you know, with this kind of a little fake humility kind of stuff where, oh, we're unworthy. No, no, no. Come boldly. Come with confidence is what it literally means. You have confidence. God loves you. God saves you. God wants you. God provides for you. God has given everything for you. 
God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to know. He wants you to, to, be, a, to be a champion in life. Don't come backing up to the door of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace, confidently to the throne of grace. Not arrogantly, not brashly, but with confidence come to the throne of grace. And James says, whenever you pray, you need to pray that way. You need to say, Lord, this is what I'm going through, and Lord, I need to know what's going on here. Talk to my heart, Lord. I know you've got a reason for this, and I want to know that reason. Help me to walk with you. I don't want to fight this. I don't want to go the wrong direction. I don't want to have to go through this again. So, Lord, I'm asking you, give me wisdom about this. I mean, with confidence, don't sheepishly go in there and uh, what one writer uh, wrote, uh, uh, um, what, what was his words? Uh, uh, don't weep your prayers. Don't... Uh, uh, don't worry. That's it. Don't worry your prayers. Have you ever seen anybody worry their prayers? Worry. Their, their, their worry is the only way they pray. Oh God, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Oh God, I don't know what. Lord, this looks so bad. It's never been this bad before. And God, I don't know how I'm going to make it through. And I see you're worrying and that's your prayer. Don't worry your prayers. Pray your prayers. Lord, this is, this is what, are we, what are we going through here? How can I make it through this? What is this about? Lord, help me to see it the way you see it. Help me to walk through it with faith and confidence and victory and boldness. Lord, I know that you brought me in here for a purpose. I know that there's a reason for this. And, and, and Lord, I want to know that reason. And, and even if it's on my own ignorance that I got into this, Lord, I want to know how to get out of this. And I want you to carry me through. And I want to see what you do. And I want to cooperate with you and not curse my own life. I mean, when you, if you need wisdom, he said, ask him for it. Just like that, but don't ask doubting, because if you ask doubting, you're not going to get anything, because you're unstable in all of your ways, all of them, not just your spiritual ways, but all of your ways, your physical ways, financial ways, family ways, neighbor ways, you know, all your ways. Let the, brother, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. And this was the twin trials of poverty and plenty, and we've talked a lot about that, so I won't go back through that. But you just, just know that you're going to face trials uh, because you don't have anything. Most of us will be in that. Most people do not face the trial of plenty. I'm sure that there are at least one or two people in this room, most likely, besides Beverly and Lawrence, that have faced the trial of plenty in life. That means somebody that has everything, you know? And it is a trial, by the way. I know some of you are sitting here going, man, I'd love to try that one. You know, I'd like that trial of plenty. I believe I could pass that thing, you know, real easy. But uh, it is a trial, and it is a, a very strict thing in life. And so in verse 12, uh, let the brother, lowly, uh, uh, brother, uh, lowly brother, brother that's been put down, brother that's been messed up, uh, glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. And it's just giving you the idea, James is just saying, look, just think about a flower out in the field, and it's beautiful, and you admire it, and it's lovely, and it's wonderful, and, and, and it gives you comfort, and it, and it looks pretty, and it does all of that stuff. But just remember that as soon as you look at that flower, and then the sun comes up for no sooner than the sun is risen with a burning heat, then it withers the grass. It, it, its flower falls, and it's beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. It's just basically saying that prosperity is, is fleeting. I mean, I know every one of us in this building think if we were rich, boy, life would be great. Right? Man, if I was rich, life would be great. That's what you're thinking. And James is saying to this, James is saying, just as soon as you begin to admire that prosperity that you're living in, it, could, it would vanish just as quickly. In other words, prosperity is not something that lasts. It's not something to be counted on. It's not something you can depend on. It can fade away as quickly as a, as a, as a flower in the hot sun. You know? So James says, don't put your confidence in that kind of stuff. Now, he says, blessed is the man who endures testing. In other words, whether you go through the trial of plenty or whether you go through the trial of poverty, whichever one of those trials you go through Either one is going to be a real test for you, and it's going to require some endurance for you, but if you will endure it, then uh, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. In other words, if you pass this test and you move on through this test, God's going to bless you on this earth and in the world to come. 
Verse 13, let no one say, somebody must have stood up in the middle of James' sermon. James, the book of James is like a bunch of sermon notes. I don't know if you've read it, but it is. It's like a bunch of sermon notes. And James is up here preaching, and James is talking about this being tested by God and going through these tests and how God puts us through tests, and we endure these tests, and these tests are going to work something good in our life, and, 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 and they're not going to kill us, and they're not going to lead us to sin. They're going to bless us and lift us. And somebody in the congregation must have stood up and said, well, James, wait a minute, buddy. I got, and let me ask you this question. You know, I, I don't think I'm going through testing from God. I think I'm being tempted by God. And James says, sit down. Sit down shut up. Sit down. Man, you, that, that's the craziest thing I ever heard in my life. God does not tempt anyone. In other words, God can't be tempted by evil. So God doesn't use temptation to work in your life with it. As a matter of fact, it, it, the sentence there is much deeper than what it looks. Ba basically, if you want to paraphrase it, here would be the sentence James says. Look, I'm telling you what, God, not, not only does God not tempt you, God is not even tempted with the idea of using temptation to work in your life. That is so foreign to the nature of God. It is so far away from anything God is. God can't even be tempted with doing that to you. And then he starts, he comes on and he says, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted for God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But every person is tempted. Look at your neighbor and say, but you are tempted. But you are tempted. Okay, James is not saying we're not tempted. He just says it's not God doing it. James says, we each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Uh, get the picture in your mind of a fisherman. I mean, this is really an easy word picture to associate with this whole little line here. Get, a, get the picture of a fisherman who, who looks at the water conditions and looks at the type of fish that are supposedly there, look at the wind conditions, look at the depth of the water, look at what kind of uh, uh, debris and so forth there are around, and then he chooses uh, carefully a lure that will be the best lure to entice these fish he, they, they will eat this. They like this when the weather conditions are like this and the wind's blowing and the, and the things. And, and if you'll just throw it right out there and let it drop off, it'll drop into a little bit of depth. And then you just pluck it up, pluck it up, make it flurry, flurry, flurry. And man, they just, they just cannot resist. Just bam, they cannot resist this thing. This is, this is the picture that James is saying here. That's exactly what he said. He said, like a fisherman entices a fish with a lure, the devil entices you that same way. You know what? He knows what you like. He knows your weakness. He knows what you will most likely choose given certain conditions. And he offers those conditions to you hoping that you will bite so that then he can drag you in and you can end up in a pot of hot grease before it's all over with. That's his plan for you. I mean, the devil has lures all over this world. Some have flashing lights. Some have, you know, pretty people. Some have attractive entrances. Some, you know, look like Taj Mahal. I mean, there are, there are, there are uh, uh, fish ponds, the devil's fish ponds all over this world. And James says, this is how temptation works. The devil takes advantage of you. God does not take advantage of you. He's, he's still on his subject now. He's still on his, he's still on his thesis, and his thesis is that God uses trials to lift you in life, to better you, to grow you, to mature you, to help you be better and help you function better. And the devil, on the other hand, uses temptation to drag you down, to kill your life, to destroy your goodness, to take everything away from you. And so James is saying, look, when you're suffering, you've got to understand that there is a difference between what God is doing in your life and what the enemy wants to do in your life. So make no mistake about it. Lust, when it's, it, it, he goes on to say, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. In other words, uh, 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 enticement, desire, and uh, uh, enticement and lust get together, and, they, and, and lust gets pregnant and, and, and has a baby, and the baby's name is sin, and then sin grows up, and when sin grows up, he becomes a serial killer. I mean, this is how, this is how our lives go progressively down. 
James is saying that's the pattern right there, and that's what happens to it. So don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. In other words, don't get mixed up between temptation and trial. He says this is just vital. I know you're sitting here going, all right, pastor, I'm not going to get mixed up between temptation and trial. Well, yes, you are. You, you know, I'm just beating this dead horse because James beats this dead horse and says, Look, got it, got it. Put this on a billboard. Put it out at the crossroads of the road out there. Do not be deceived by this. Do not think the wrong way. And then he goes on to say, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, James says, put this on a big poster board. Put it at the crossroads of the road out there and say, God never gives anything bad. God only gives good stuff. If it's good, it came from God. If it's bad, it came from the devil. There's not one shadow of turning in the goodness of God. There's only goodness that comes down like, like rays of light from the Father of lights, and there's not even one little shadow, not one degree of turning does God do. God's not fickle. God's not two-faced. God, you know, God is only good. Only good things come from God. Now, they may not be pleasant things, but they're good things. Even things that are unpleasant can be good things. Even the things that challenge us from God are good things as opposed to being sinful things. They don't encourage us to sin. They don't drag us into sin. They don't enhance sin in our life. They enhance our opportunity to go forward and to be stronger and to be better and to, and to have some proof of our life. Wouldn't you like, you know, there are all kinds of people that claim they know Jesus. I don't know if you know this. If you've ever asked anybody, hey man, are you a Christian? Or you get to talking to them in some kind of conversation and they're talking about praying or the Lord and you say, well man, you must be a Christian. And they'll say, well, I'm trying to be or I hope to be or whatever it is. I rarely meet somebody who doesn't claim to be a Christian. But there are going to be a lot of people that think they're Christians that are not going to heaven when they die. Now what I would ask you is, are you one of them? Do you go, are you going to heaven when you die? And you would say, well, how can I know? Well, how you respond in the, in the sufferings of life give you an indication as to where your faith lies. And James says one of the things that testing from God does is it gives you an opportunity to check yourself out to see if you respond like a child of God ought to respond. Because I'm going to tell you, if your faith doesn't act right, it's not right. All right, all right. And you want to know that before you stand before the Lord one day, I would think you would, right? You would want to know on this side of eternity, while there's still time for you to make some adjustments and some changes, whether you're going to stand before him and, and, and here enter into the joys of heaven, my good and faithful servant, or, enter, or here depart from me, you who work wicked, I never knew you. You do want to know which one of those you're going to hear, right? James says, let me tell you how you can know. How do you respond in the sufferings of God? How does God work in your life? How do you receive these things from the Lord? These are all indications of whether you are real or not. Because everybody's singing, I'm going to heaven when I die, and when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing I'll be. Everybody's singing, when we all get to heaven, ain't going there. So I want to know if I'm one of them that is or one of them that's not. How does that happen? Count it all joy when these trials come into my life. James says God has given you an opportunity to show what you really are. So see, I can be joyful about the fact that something just popped into my life that's going to give me a chance to see where I really am and to see who I really am. And instead of crybabying and moaning and griping and bellying, you know, it always happens to me. Why well, can't nothing ain't good happen to me? Nothing happens to me. Just moaning and, and crying about how unfair everything is. Why don't you look at God and say, God, what is this in my life? And how can I profit from this? And what can benefit me from this? God, I want to be your man. I want to, I, want to, I want to show the world what a Christian looks like when things don't go their way. I'd like to have a little strength popped up in my life. I'd like to prove myself just a little bit, God. 
Thank you for allowing this to come into my life because now I get to see what I really am. Because I don't want to be surprised one day when I stand in your presence, when it's too late. So James says, this is what it is. Every good gift, make, make no mistakes, of his own will. He's, still, he's talking about God. He says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. And last week I grabbed, grabbed Michael's, but I brought mine today. The word of truth. Yeah, yeah. You say, what is the word of truth? It's the word of God. The word of God is the word of truth. What does this verse say? This verse says that God himself had a will and his will made it, made it, made a way for me to be birthed on this earth to be sort of a, what he says, first fruits of his creatures. In other words, the will of God put me on this earth so I could kind of be a bright and shining light to the rest of creation about what the nature of God is really like. And so what God did of his own will, now get this now, this wasn't something that we contrived God to do or that we bullied God to do or that we shamed God to do. This was something that came out of God's own heart that, that no one consoled him to do. He did it out of his own will. He looked at a point of time and he said, Wesley, I, I'm going to birth you at this time. And Keith, I'm going to birth you at this time. And Tanya, I'm going to birth you at this time. And Beverly, I'm going to birth you at this time. Because God looked through eternity. God saw a need for somebody like us. He put us right here on this earth. He put a seed inside of us. He began to fertilize the seed. He began to water the seed. The seed began to grow. And now all of a sudden it's time for the seed to produce fruit. And do you know what the fruit is? The fruit is the image of Jesus Christ. What is the purpose of God for our life? That we would be conformed to the image of his son, that we would reflect the image of Jesus Christ. And so he says, look, we are, a, we are an example to this world. God put us here to shine his light. You don't put a light under a bushel basket. You pull a basket off so the light can give light to everyone who sees. And so James is saying, that's God's purpose. That's God's intent. That's why God gives good things. That's why God puts you through trials. That's why God allows suffering into your life so that you can be birthed forth and bear fruit that has some value to it. And it's real and not phony and fake. But in order to shine like this, you've got to receive the word in suffering properly. You remember I said, when you need wisdom from God, you ask him. And I told you, he will tell you. So how's God going to tell you? I mean, what is, what, how, how's he going to get the word to you? What is he going to say to you? How are you going to hear the voice of God? When you pray and say, God, what is going on and how can this be? And then God's going to answer you. How is he going to speak to you? Well, James says it in the same verse where he says he'll do it. He says, by the word of truth, this verse we just read up here. God, by his own will, created us with the word of truth. In other words, God's going to use his word to talk to you because it's the word that tells you how you're supposed to act. It's the word that tells you what suffering is all about. Yeah, yeah. It's the word that tells you how to respond to suffering when suffering comes into your life. It's the word of God. So James says, by his own will, he, he birthed us by the word of truth. Mm -hmm. So how we respond to this word of truth is what determines how we respond to suffering in our life. And, 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 and in the next three verses, 19, 20, and 21, there are five, five ways, five things God says about how you're to receive this word in suffering. How you are to approach this word when you are suffering so that God can give you an answer as to what's going on in your life and what you need to do about it, and maybe how long it's going to last, and what kind of weapons you have to fight it with, and what kind of people you need in your life, and what you need to think in your life, and how you need to act in your life, and how you need to respond in your life. Here it is, right here, right here. How do you respond to it? Well, here's the, first, here's the, ve the very, very next verse, very next verse. Well, let me, just put, let me just tell you quickly. Put that in the blank. Then I'll give you the verse, all right? 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, quickly, quickly. Verse 19. So my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Swift to hear. Now that swift to hear doesn't mean swift to hear everything. It means that there are some things that we should try not to hear. Are you listening to me? That there are things that we should try not to uh, give ourselves to. That we are to be swift to hear the word of God is what he's saying. Let every man be swift to listen to the word of truth. Not just any word. Not these crazy words we hear out here in the world. Not these crazy things we hear on the radio. Not the crazy things that come over the TV. I mean, I've had people actually come to a prayer meeting and ask us to pray for somebody and find out that that's somebody in general hospital on one of the soaps in the TV. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, it's like, what world are you in? What planet are you in? You're, you are torn up about somebody on general hospital? I mean, you know, come on, man. Swift to hear, not swift to hear everything, but swift to hear the things of God. To put all of those things that are not purposeful and, and, and godly and righteous and good and honest. and no, well, I mean, what does Paul say about what we're to listen to? Paul says, whatever things are true, whatever things are just, whatever things are noble, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if it's praiseworthy, think on these things. Not on the latest gossip and the latest gab and the soap opera and what somebody thinks on the radio and what's going on on some TV show. I mean, no, it's no wonder we're so messed up with the, all the different crazy stuff we put in ourselves. James says we need to be swift to hear the things that God says to us. And he uses the word swift, and I mean, I don't want to drag you down into this little micro stuff, but, but maybe this is something I think is interesting. The word swift comes from the Greek word takus, not taco, but takus. <laughs> takus is the word that we get our English word tachometer from. Now, thanks to modern technology and most of our automobiles that are fairly new nowadays, we know what a tachometer is. It's that little dial generally beside your, your mileage dial, your miles per hour gauge, that when you turn your automobile on, this little gauge, even though you may be sitting there parked and your car is going nowhere, that gauge is revving up and down like this because that gauge is showing you something. A tachometer shows you revolutions or velocity of your engine. And as it goes up, it gets more intense. And as it goes down, the engine's running slower. So what, what is James saying? James is saying that like, like, uh, like we look at our tachometer to determine whether our automobile is functioning at a certain rate, even though it may not be moving, it may not be going, this thing gives me an indication of what's going on inside that engine. He says, that's the way it ought to be. In other words, we should measure the, our receptivity of the word. It would be a good thing for us to look at ourselves and determine how quickly do I receive the Word of God. With, 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 with an increasing intensity. You know, I mean, it's like as that tachometer goes up and the engine, and, and you feel that intensity come forward. James is saying, that's how it is with the Word of God. We're to be swift. We're, we're to measure how receptive. Do, do I quickly move to the Word of God? Do I quickly hear the Word of God? Are my ears dull? I don't want to hear and I don't want to have anything to do. Do I run away from the Word of God? Am I interested in every gab story and every grab story and every you know offshoot? And every, or do I quickly uh, avail myself to the Word of God? When my church all offers teachings. Am I there? Do I want to hear the Word of God? Because I'm going to tell you what, you know what's going to change your life? This is going to change your life. The nightly news is not going to change your life. As a matter of fact, I can already tell you what's going to be on the nightly news. Nothing good. 
Nothing good. Everything good you need to know is right here. This is what you need to focus on. And, and it, like with an increasing intensity, as this world gets worse and worse and worse, I get more and more focused on the, what's, on the good news and what God says. And James says, I got to be swift to hear the word of God. If, I'm, if God's going to communicate with me when I'm in the middle of these trials, when I'm, man, when, when, when I'm suffering and when things are going bad, I, boy, I got to be swift to run to the word of God. I got to be swift to hear with an, with an increasing intensity and an increasing urgency. You know what the Bible says about, about babes, you know, just our little regular babes that we have around? It says like, like, like newborn babes desire the, the, the pure milk of the word, uh, uh, of, of, of the bottle, uh, you desire the word that way. In other words, Jesus says like newborn babies uh, chase after the bottle with such a tremendous urgency. Have you, seen, have you seen newborns chase after bottles or nipples, you know? I wouldn't embarrass anybody, but, you know. Uh, I mean, you watch him. You watch him. The little fella, I mean, he, he doesn't have a lot of control. You know, his neck muscles are not stable. His little head's not stable. And his, his eyes, his eyes can't see good. You know, I mean, he, he doesn't have clear vision. So he's looking and, he, and, he's, just, and he's, just, he's just bobbing around. Got that mouth open, just ah, 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 bobbing around. And then all of a sudden, you know, he, boom, he hits it. And buddy, when he hits that nipple, buddy, he latches on with everything he's got. <laughs> That's what James says we are to be about when it comes to the word of God. That we're to just, that, that just like a newborn goes after him, but just goes after it with all he's got. That's how we are. We're to be voracious about hearing the word of God, about filling our hearts and minds and our spirits with the word of God, because it's the word of God that's going to tell us how we can, we can conquer this and how we can make it through this and how we can go on through this and stop spending so much time on other junk, filling up your life. That's not going to tell you anything. Get on the word, be swift to hear the word of God. And then he says, all right, so the first adverb is we're to hear the word of God quickly. All right, here's the second one. Quietly. I know you're going, oh my goodness, what is this? All right, well, let's see what it is. Let me see if I can get here we go. Let me see if I can get my little deal working. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. What's next? Slow to speak. Slow to speak. In other words, the implication is that we should listen more and talk less, right? And I know you've heard me say this a bunch of times, and it's not funny anymore, but, but it, it makes a point. Uh, God gave us two ears and one tongue, which implies what? Listen twice as much as you talk. The Lord has also placed these ears out here in the open, unrestricted, placed this tongue inside this, these ivory bars right here in order to keep it from protruding out. Has anybody ever come up to you and said, look at my tongue? <laughs> no. I am to be swift to hear the word of God, and I am to be slow to speak. James will later on in the book, in the third chapter, and I know you'll be so happy when we get there. The third chapter, you think you will. The whole third chapter is about the tongue, by the way. The whole third chapter. Every chapter in James has something to say about the tongue, by the way. Every one of them, all five, have something to say about the tongue. I ought to tell you about something. Man, somebody in James' life is having trouble with their mouth, right? I think so. But he says this. He says, all right. In chapter 3, he says, don't every one of you get up and try to be teachers because you need to know something. If you're a teacher, God's going to hold you to a higher level of accountability than he is everybody else that just sits there and listens. So before you jump up and start talking, you need to know that once you start talking, God's going to start holding you to a higher standard. So you better make sure you know what you're talking about before you start talking. In other words, there ought to be a few speaking and there ought to be many people listening to the word of God quietly, without talking. Let God speak to you. 
The idea here, I think, and this is just my thought, so when you stand before Jesus one day, don't try to use this. Just, you know, I mean, just say, okay, my pastor said he thought this is what it means. All right, so think, think about this. I'm think about this. I'm thinking that what James is talking about is meditating on the Word. I'm, I, I'm thinking that what James is saying is reflect on what you are thinking before you say something. Be swift to hear and slow to speak. Let, before you start speaking stuff, think about what you're speaking. Let it get inside of you. I, I came through an age, because I've been in the ministry so long and been in this world so long, that I, I've come through all kinds of church ages and church times and so forth. I came through a time when there used to be uh, uh, Bible studies every night, uh, the Jesus movement and all that. And you know what we did? We went to a different Bible study every night, three or four nights a week. Man, Bible study here at this house, Bible study there at the church. At the, I mean, we just went because everybody wanted to just start talking about God and the Word of God and all that kind of stuff because everybody was so excited about Jesus and the Spirit. And I, I mean, we were, we were baptizing people in, in swimming pools and stuff like this. This was the Jesus freaks out in California wearing the little hippie sandals and all that. I mean, th th that was the generation. And so we had Bible studies four or five nights a week. And you know what I think James is saying? I think James is saying, hey, don't, don't go to Bible studies four or five nights a week. Go to Bible studies maybe once or twice and then spend the rest of that time reflecting on what you have heard and how you can begin to live out what you have heard in life. Be slow to speak it. I, most of us already know way more than we do, right? Do the parts of the Bible that you don't know anything about bother you? You know, I, I used to think, yeah, I've been with the Lord all these years, and I've studied all this stuff and have all these degrees and stuff. And, and I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of things in the Word of God I don't know anything about. And, and, and I won't know anything about them unless God gets ready for me to, to know about them, and then he'll reveal truth to me because truth is revealed, not discovered. But anyway, that's another sermon. But, it's, but I'm going to tell you this. It's not the stuff that I don't understand about the Bible that bothers me. It's the stuff I do understand. It's the stuff I know I'm supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to be about. I know I'm supposed to avoid. It's that kind of stuff that bothers me. And all James is saying is, listen, be swift to hear what God says to you and be slow to... Let it sink into you. Let it, let it meditate into you. Let it become part of your thinking pattern. So I am to receive the word quickly, and I'm to receive the word quietly, and then thirdly, I'm to receive the word calmly. He says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and let me put the verse up, slow to wrath. <coughs> slow to wrath for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. He, he goes on in verse 20. All right, covering this just a second. My anger, wrath, by the way, is the outward expression of anger. If somebody pours out wrath, what they are pouring out is, their, is an expression of their anger. Like a teenager who slams the door when their parents get on to them and leave, that's wrath. Uh, when someone gets in an automobile after having an argument and scratches out of the driveway and scratches down the road throwing gravel or squealing rubber or whatever, that's wrath. That's an expression of their anger. So what is the Bible saying here? What is James saying? James is saying that our anger does nothing to help what God is trying to do inside of us with his word. As a matter of fact, our anger actually hinders what God is doing in our life. It blocks, it blocks the word from us. How many of you have experienced, and don't point and look straight ahead, if you will. This is just rhetorical, okay? How many of you have experienced uh, such a scenario as this? Uh, you get up on Sunday morning, 
uh, everybody's, it's, it's time to get up for everybody to come to church. And you go through the house and it's, hup, ho, let's go. It's time to go to church. Well, every other day of the week, it works good. That works fine. Everybody gets up. They get, start getting dressed for school and work and blah, blah, blah. But on Sunday, that doesn't work the same way. It's kind of, it's freaky, isn't it? How stuff that works the rest of the week doesn't work on Sunday. And medicine is the same way. You know, an aspirin works good on Monday, but it doesn't work on Sunday for some reason. We got to stay home from church. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's just a personal point of view. Okay. All right. But it's hup-ho, let's go, all right? And about half of you get up and you start getting dressed and you get everything and you get a few little things to eat and you start getting dressed. And the other ones have now just now started to drag up. Come on, you know we got to go to church. You got to go. And then they just start dragging up. And you, and you are in the car and, and you're ready to go and you're honk, honk, honk. It's time to go, honk, honk, honk. Well, that's just making everybody in there just lovely, uh, sweet and happy and, and blessed. And, and they come out and they get in the automobile and finally you're on your way to church and that car is just rocking and rolling like this, like all the way down the street, just anger, hostility. Why, yeah, 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 yeah. Tell him, quit looking at me. She touched me, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, like magic, as soon as the, the wheels of that automobile touch the pavement of the church parking lot, m- magic happens. It's like a whole demeanor comes over everybody and you step out of the car and it's, how are you today, brother? Oh, wonderful. I'm doing fine, aren't you? How are you doing? It's a blessed day and a wonderful day in the Lord. Yeah. Holy Ghost, bless God. Amen. I'm ready. I'm glad. To... Just a few minutes ago, you just rocking and rolling coming down. You're still hot on the inside, still angry. They said this to you, didn't they? You come into the sanctuary. You sit down in these chairs. You're still mad about what was going on at home. You're still hostile about that. You're all out of snuff and everything else. And then God starts speaking to you and how difficult it is for God to break through that anger and get you out of that. That's, that's what James is saying. Be slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. Because the wrath, wrath of man does nothing to enhance the word of God. Let me, let me give you one little isolated thought here. And, and maybe you've never heard this before. But, but you know, Moses in the Old Testament, Moses uh, carried the children of Israel out of Egypt. You're right. Everybody's got that. All right. I don't need to tell all that story. All right, Moses takes them out of Egypt. But before he takes them out of Egypt, of course, he's born, and they're killing all the little babies. And so Moses' mother puts him in this little basket and floats him in the river. And Pharaoh's daughter gets him out of the river and and takes him home and gets Moses' mother to be his little nursemaid. How how convenient is that? You get a little nursemaid, take care of him at the palace of Pharaoh. So Moses grows up as an Egyptian. He's a Hebrew, but he grows up like an Egyptian. But he never loses the fact that he's a Hebrew. And one day when he gets a little bit older, gets to be a young man, almost 20 years old or so, roughly, or, or around in there, uh, he, uh, he sees this, uh, this Egyptian beating this Hebrew slave. And he gets so hostile and mad. He gets so filled with anger that it just boils over. He can't control it. He, he doesn't, he, he just so angry, he just takes things into his own hands and he does what he wants to do. And so he kills this Egyptian and he hides the body and, and, and he hopes nobody saw it, but somebody did see it. And somebody said to him a few days later when they were in some kind of an argument, a little discussion, this guy said, are you going to do the same thing to me you did to that guy out there? You going to kill me too? Well, see, now Moses knows everybody knows about this. So, he, so now he has to run for his life because he doesn't want to be put on the gallows in Egypt for being a murderer. So he runs to the backside of the desert. I call it the backside motel. Moses spends 40 years in the backside motel on the backside of the desert. He marries a sweet woman whose father-in-law, Jethro, has a bunch of sheep and so forth, and Moses becomes a shepherd on the backside of the desert. One day, the Lord speaks to Moses out of a bush and says, Moses, I got a job for you. I want you to go down there to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And to make a long story short, Moses does all of that and all the things he did. And then he leads them out and they go through the Red Sea and they, God covers it up and then they get on the other side and they get out there in the middle of the desert and, they're, and, and they have no water. And so God says to Moses, he says, uh, go speak to that rock and, and it'll give you water. So Moses goes over there to the rock. 
But instead of speaking to the rock, Moses takes his rod, the rod of God, the one that parted the Red Sea, the one that did all the miracles, the rod of God, the one that turned into a snake and turned back into a rod. And Moses took the rod and struck the rock twice. And water starts flowing out of the rock. And God looks at Moses and God says, you're not going into the promised land. The rest of Israel will go in, but you can't go. Now that sound, that, that, I, I've always thought that sounded like God overreacted to this. I'm thinking, God, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, come on, you said, hit, you said strike it. I mean, you said speak and he struck it. I mean, that's not really like a big major deal, is it? But it was big enough that God said, you're not going into the promised land. So here's what I'm saying to you. I mean, this is just a perspective. We're talking about receiving the word calmly now, without anger. And I'm just thinking, you know what? When Moses struck that rock, you know what that said to God? God, I've been on the backside of the desert for 40 years, and I'm still mad about all this stuff. I'm still acting out of my own impulse. I'm still filled with hostility and anger on the inside of me. He said, rock! I mean, it, rock just became a vehicle by which he expressed the fact that even though he had been out there for 40 years, he was still burning with that hostility on the inside of him. And God says, you're not going into the promised land with all that burning anger inside of you. And I'm just wondering how many of us are not going into our promised land simply because we can't let go of our anger. And I'm saying that to receive the word of God in suffering, we're going to have to let go of that anger. And we're going to have to quit feeding that anger. And let me just say this to you, and heaven knows I, I can't keep on going, but I got two more things, but I'm, I'm going to let you go. But let me just say, I'm not spending all next week on two things either, so let me just say this to you. Stop feeding yourself with all of this media that is doing nothing but feeding your anger. Now, I don't, I'm not talking to any person in here particularly. I'm just talking to all of us. And I'm just saying to you that that verse right there says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That verse says that the angrier I stay, the less of God I reflect out of my life. And right now we're living in a world that is intentionally, are you hearing me? Intentionally creating anger in us. Hostility and strife. It's creating division, divisiveness. Get off of Facebook. Get off of Twitter. Give yourself a break. Quit looking at that junk. Pray. Ask God. Read the Word. Come to Bible study. Get something else to think about. And let God speak to you because that anger that you're being filled with is doing nothing but hindering you from receiving what God wants to say to you in life. Now, I know you're probably going to do some of that and not all of it, and hopefully you'll do some, but just remember when you stand before the Lord one day, I told you, okay? <laughs> just remember that. All right, all right, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand. <laughs>